morning. This is Jim Moore, and you're watching Words of Encouragement, and it is Monday, December 19th, and this is episode number 578. Come to me, all you who are weary, the famous words of the Lord Jesus. We're going to talk about that today, about coming to the Lord and, uh, and what it takes to walk with him, because we don't want to just come to him when we're weary, right? We want to come to him all the time and learn to live uh, with him, and not just for him, but with him, and find out the good things that he has for us. So greetings today. Um, yeah, before we get into the scripture, it's, uh, I don't know if you see, but it's really kind of uncharacteristically dark outside today. Uh, it's really kind of strange. Normally, by this time of the day, it's nine o'clock my time, so the sun's been up for, you know, a while, not a couple hours. So, and this is, I guess, because of the cloud cover and the weather and all that. You know, that's the one thing about weather is a lot like life, like the atmosphere that we live in. Hey, Deb, God bless you. Nice to have you this morning again. So faithful. Um, but, you know, stuff changes. <clears throat> I've been transparent with you before about how I'm trying to adjust my laptop so it doesn't shine in my eyes. Um, you know, some days we you wake up and hi, there's my lovely, lovely Linda. Amen. Good morning, my sweet. Um, yeah, you know, sometimes, you know, you wake up and the sun is shining and everything is bright and beautiful and you just feel like you can take on the world, right? You know, and then other times you wake up and it's, it's cloudy and it's kind of darkish and there's, yeah. I mean, you can learn to take joy in all of that stuff, but, and, well, and I guess that's the point. And there's the other Linda. God bless you. Nice to have you. We have to learn as Christians not to be moved by uh, our immediate feelings. We really do. We have to learn how to know that God is in control. One of the things that the Lord showed me years ago before I jump into the scripture is um, that the sun is always out. Okay. <laughs> We say, well, no, it's not out, you dummy. It's dark outside, you know, the cloud, it's raining, it's horrible. No, my dad was a pilot, and um, so he taught people how to fly, which, yeah, it's kind of cool. But he would get in the plane, and we'd get in the plane like it is right now. And I'm like, what a horrible day to fly. And he'd go, no, just you wait. And then he would go up into the clouds, and uh, which is cool too, and then it's, we would crest the cloud cover and it was sunny it's always sunny up there and i you know years later after i became a believer the lord reminded me of that and he said you know it's always sunny somewhere you just got to get to where the sun is and uh, i feel like that's a great illustration for life remember no matter what you're going through no matter how dark things might be or you know predictably dark they're going to get God is always on the job. He's never far away. Sometimes it feels like he's a long ways away, but that is that feeling is not true. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So point number one about, you know, coming to the Lord when you're weary is don't just come seeking, you know, relief, although that's good, but come to him. He's the son, right? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> anyway, yeah, and we got to prepare. I don't know about the rest of you guys, but we're going to get some really cold weather in the next few days. And thank God for those who can give you a heads up. Call it a warning, call it a prediction, call it whatever you want. But I'm thankful for people who go, hey, this is going to be coming down the road, whether it's economics, whether it's the weather or something, spirit, whatever. I appreciate that. I really do. Because then I can go, oh, okay, so it's supposed to get 10 degrees here, 10 degrees in Texas. What is that all about? In the next uh, couple of days. So what do we got to do to make sure that doesn't devastate our world? Okay. Okay. So that's the nature. And when the Lord gives some kind of an instruction or a warning, you know, we like some words better than others. So we don't want to say warning. We'll say a heads up. That just, oh, that makes me feel better. So when the Lord gives a heads up about something, he's not being mean. He's not being Debbie Downer or, or Nancy Negative. That <laughs> He's trying to help, right? He's always trying to help. All right. So uh, thank you for those of you who have been praying for us. Today is Monday. We have our 
our class tonight uh, for the Song of Songs. It's always a wonderful time. Uh, appreciate those of you who pray for us and those of you who are part of the class. So, All right, <clears throat> let's take a look at the scriptures. Now I'm going to have to take my glasses off here because I cannot see you and it very well. So let's look at what the Word of God says about coming to the Lord. And, um, you know, I kind of feel like sometimes these subjects that we talk about, they can kind of get a little boring, if that makes sense. You know, oh, yeah, I've read that so many times. You know, I, I need something a little more titillating, something a little more, you know, I, I, I want to hear the exciting. We're actually even drawn to bad news because it's, exci it's exciting and adventurous feeling. It's crazy, but it's true. Um, but understand the relevance of getting your heart because I'm going to talk about the heart today, established, rooted, the Bible says. Think about the fact that God invented root systems. <laughs> I don't know if you thought about this, but there were no such things as trees and plants and bushes before God invented them. Okay, and one of the things he invented, hey Angie, God bless, one of the things he invented is that living things, they do have something on the outward that you can see, but what sustains them is not what the outward. See, I see the outward as what we feel, what we perceive, you know, all of this. But it's the inward. It's what's going on on the inside in the heart and the foundation, the root system that holds. You know, if the weather blasts, the sun heats, the frost comes, it can pretty much wipe out what's going on on the surface. You understand what I mean? So the surface, that's this, that's your hand, that's your body, that's your emotions, that's how you feel, it's, it's everything, you know, outward, everything on top of the ground, as it were. But then the heart, that's what's the root system, or what we call the foundation. So when we, I want to talk about what's going on on the inside, because you need to make sure you are stable in the midst of the good, the bad, and the ugly that are ha that's happening around the world. And it's all happening, okay? There are better things happening in the world today than you don't. <laughs> I guarantee it. There are greater things going on in the world. People getting saved, you know, uh, you know, people being healed, people being delivered, marriages being restored, unjust laws being overturned. I mean, there are good things happening in the world, okay? You don't really need to be warned about the good things. But it is so encouraging. We do need to be warned about the bad things, I think, sometimes, because we don't want to see them. We just don't. Just don't. Just turn it off. I don't care. I don't care. So God gives warnings because he knows we don't want to hear them. <laughs> okay. And, but we need to. But the good stuff that's going on, we need to see that because it's like, yes, God is moving. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I know there are going to be some people that totally disagree with my statement right now. <clears throat> But I'm going to say it anyway, because you know me, and that's what I do. I'm not saying it because they disagree, but in spite of it. So there is a global phenomenon that's happening right now in the um, genre, in the venue, through the venue of media. Now, I believe the devil controls much of what's going on in media. But I also see the, the expansion of individuals, just regular Joes like you and I or Josephines, regular human beings being able to access multiple media and actually be a part of it as God's answer to the enemy's gradual gain of control over the media. Now, I sound like I'm doing just for America today, but I'm not. This is important. So God actually has pro provided a way that we can see what he's doing in the world, not just what the enemy's doing and sound the alarm and make a stand, shine the light on the darkness. We're absolutely called to do that. Okay. But also to say, oh, look what God is doing over here. So this global phenomena that's happening right now through the outlet of media is this movie called The Chosen. Now, immediately I can hear the voices. Okay. What about this? What about this? Listen, listen, listen. 
I'm going to tell you the truth right now. Nothing's perfect. Nothing gets it all together right. You never get it all the way right. You're not perfect. Your theology, I know, right? Believe it or not, is not perfect. There are flawed areas of it. But we have to look for the fingerprints of God. We've got to look and we've got to say, what's the Lord doing? Okay, is Anyway, this, this movie called The Chosen uh, by Dallas Jenkins, I do put a link on here. Uh, where he is being interviewed by Glenn Beck, uh, another man I greatly uh, respect. I, again, I don't agree with every. I, I've said this so many times. I don't agree with everybody. I mean, I don't agree with everything anybody says. Okay? <laughs> You're supposed to, you know, not be so open-minded. Your brains fall out. So, I, you know, nobody out there to me is Jesus. All right? I don't know how to say it. Nobody out there is Jesus. Nobody's out there. And we're so quick to give our opinion on everything. Sometimes we have this preconceived paradigm of stuff. And, well, I heard this, and I heard this, and I heard this. And so we shut the thing down, and we're not able to receive what it is the Lord's actually doing. Would it shock you if I told you that God is doing things through sinners? I know, right? Shock of shocks. He always has. Okay? It even talks about Ananias who was used of the devil, you know, to do some persecuting things in the Bible, actually prophesied. <laughs> so it's not like he he makes the wrath of man to praise him. Now, I'm not saying this about Dallas. I think Dallas and uh, Glenn, they're on different planes, but they're both, I believe they're true believers in Jesus. Now, I know some people have talked about, um, <clears throat> oh, I just forgot his name, Glenn, and uh, his religious background and all that. I don't know that much about it yet, so I'm not going to go into it. But I can tell you this. He knows more biblical New Testament theology about Jesus than I hear coming out of the mouth of a lot of Christians. So that tells me something. I actually pastored a church once. And there were a bunch of Mormons in my church who were true believers in Jesus. There's no way you convinced me otherwise. Did they hold on to some of the crazy? Yes, they did. But they were also in this process of the Lord showing them stuff. So anyway, I don't want to get into all that. <clears throat> all I want to say, every time God does something good, the naysayers come out. You know, the naysayers will come out. Well, I heard this, and I heard this, and I heard this, and I heard this. And 90% of the time, they don't take any time to really investigate it. They're just So anyway, this interview that's on here, this link, is worth watching. It's very long. Um, you know, it, I always say the same thing, you know, I get, I, I shy away from two hour videos. I shy away a little less from one hour videos. I shy away, you know, it's like the shorter it gets, the more apt I am to watch it. Hey, Deb, my sis, how are you? So <clears throat> watch it. Hear what these men have to say. And think about what God is doing in the world right now. I believe, and this is my opinion, okay, you have every right to disagree with me. But I believe this movie, The Chosen, since The Passion of the Christ was also done by a man who you wouldn't have expected to do that. I believe The Passion of the Christ was far and away the best movie that has ever been made on planet Earth, period. I'm not, I'm not trying to be uh, you know, crazy on it. I just, I really believe it depicted what happened to Jesus in a way that nobody accurately had had up until that point. Flawed, yes, absolutely. They all are. They all. I don't look for the flaws. I look for the fingerprints of God, and so should you. Okay. Don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Don't get so focused on on the the minutia, you know, the 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 sliver that's in your brother's. Eye. Look at is God in this in its imperfection, and so on. So second to that, I believe that what I'm seeing right now in the chosen is definitely God. You know, if you were the devil. One of the things that you would try to do is to convince God that he or convince people that God is basically mad and bad. OK, he, instead of being a good God, he's a bad God. You would be out to convince people of the opposite. Now, you can go crazy trying to convince. I mean, you can you can try to convince people of the goodness of God to the degree. I actually saw someone do this once. They got a they got an Internet, uh, a website where they were so crazy about trying to prove the goodness of God. They went through every scripture that looked negative to them and turned it around to say something it actually didn't mean. <laughs> you don't have to you don't have to do that. There are, there are levels of the goodness of God that we will not understand until we get to heaven. It's just true. Okay. We declare his goodness even when we read that scripture that looks like it's bad. So anyway, 
So you can go crazy with that. But this film, I believe, strikes the best balance I've seen so far. And from what I hear and what I see, they're not shying away from the heart. So anyway, all that to say, okay, watch this interview. And if you haven't started watching the series, The Chosen, you should. I'm telling you, I highly recommend that you should watch it. I believe it's going to open your eyes to some things that you never thought of. Are you going to like every bit of it? Agree? No, you won't. Gosh. See, this is what I'm, I'm always telling people. We have to grow up past this to where we've got everything exactly lined out. We know everything to perfection. And bless God, we're just quick on the draw to give our opinion for every single thing that we hear from anybody. I mean, we just have to grow up a little bit and realize, hey, I know more today than I knew yesterday. That means yesterday, this stuff that I know today, I didn't know. And had I not had some level of openness to it, and even the ability to uh, believe that I might be actually, I know the W word, wrong, r -r -r wrong about something, Okay. If you don't believe that you might actually have made a mistake about something, you're not going to grow. Because trust me, we don't know everything. All right. I'm off subject. <laughs> I just, I say this because we're always in the process of learning. No process of learning. You don't throw out. You know, learn to eat the meat and, and spit out the bones. How many times have you heard that? Okay. All right. But sometimes we find our security in being right about everything. Okay. I know because I've been that guy and I'm telling you it's not healthy and I'll say one more thing and then we're gonna look at Luke uh, Luke chapter 9 <clears throat> one of the books that I have commented on and uh, recommended that every believer read because I think it is a profound revelation of the Lord Jesus that agrees with Scripture see I don't believe in revelations that contradict the Scripture Okay, now sometimes it might contradict what you think you know to be true. Who's that? Hey, James, my son. Good morning. I love you. So, um, is the final quest. Now, you've heard me say many times, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but it's phenomenal, phenomenal uh, book. And one of the things that the Lord, he's standing in front of Jesus. Now, listen, I've had a few times where I stood before the Lord. And I guarantee you, he never said anything anti-biblical, but he did say some things that changed my view a little bit of how I perceive the Bible. Anyway, so he's standing in front of Rick, and he's, he's telling him one of, are you listening? Are you ready for this? He said, one of the greatest mistakes my people make. Are you ready? I begin to give them prophetic utterances, words of knowledge, words of wisdom. In other words, I show them stuff that they would not have otherwise seen about people, about situations, then they be, are you ready? They begin to think that everything they think is me. Now, how do you know what is and what isn't? Hi, Charlene. How do you know what is and isn't? Well, it's called humility. It's called realizing that you're not always right. It's called being open for correction. It's called going back to the scriptures, you know, oh, I don't like to read. Who cares? You know, the Bible, Jesus said that the words of God are your daily bread. No wonder you feel sick and weak all the time in the spirit. Okay. Anyway, be humble, be open. So the link I put at the bottom of the page, watch it. Um, yeah, you're going to hear some good stuff. All right. Luke chapter nine, verse 23. Let me read it. Then he, now they, again, these are the words of Jesus. They're not my words. They're his words. One day you'll stand in front of him and he'll say, hey, did you remember what I said right there? Oh, no, I never read it. <laughs> Bummer, because he said on that day, I, myself, Jesus, am not going to judge you. He said the words that I spoke are going to judge you on that day. <laughs> did you even know he said that? He said, I've already said everything pretty much that I need to say about you know, life and everything. I'm going to, you're going to, you're going to, your accountability, your, all of that's going to happen because it is going to happen, right? You can't pretend it away. You can't ignore it away. It says you are going to stand and have an evaluation of your life and how you live, but you're not going to be evaluated. I'm not going to just sit there and go, you know, just arbitrarily come up with stuff about you. He says, no, the words that I have spoken, they will be your judge. I'm not doing it. In other words, you're going to, you know, he's going to recall you. I said this, did, did you, you know, Listen, whatever. 
So it's important that you know what he said. That's my point. And all right, then he said to them all, anyone, everybody, I'm an anyone, okay? If anyone desires to come after me, another translation says to follow me. You want to come after the Lord. <clears throat> you see, often what we do is we want him to come after us instead of us coming after him. Now, mark it down. He has been pursuing you your whole life. But there must come a time where you respond to that pursuit and then you begin to pursue him. Okay? Not in a way like, oh, I don't like you. I hate you. I'm standing far away from you. And so I'm Jesus and I'm better than you. So you have to do all this stuff to gain my approval. No, that's not what it means. To pursue him means to literally want what he created you for, and that's to walk with him. It's not that complicated. It really isn't. We make it so complicated. We make it mostly just about being a good boy or a good girl and just, you know, walking in righteousness and doing all the right stuff. Totally, totally good, okay? You know, you never should embrace the idea that God wants you to do bad or that it's okay or because of the cross, it doesn't matter anymore. That's foolishness. He does want you to be good, but he wants you to be good out of a heart, that loves him and not just oh yeah I love the Lord yeah he's my homeboy I have the hat got the trucker hat Jesus is my homeboy no no he wants you to want him like he like he wants you he wants you to reciprocate which means to give back the love he already has for you for God so loved you that he gave his life away on the cross while we were yet in our sin he looked down upon us and said, I want you. If he wanted you in your sin, okay, and now you've been forgiven, how much more does he want nearness to you now? It's not that complicated. You must come back to the foundation of the heart. David, a man who failed many times, was called a man after God's own laws? No. His, you know, his ways? Well, yes and yes, because... His love for God, his desire for the heart of God led him to those things, but he's called, he is maybe called those things as number two and three and four, but he is called a man after my own heart. Okay? So that's what he's looking for. So when he says these words that he's about to say, about taking up your cross, denying yourself, it's not about slavery. Okay? It's not about, you know, and the enemy sows these lies into us through religion, through unnecessarily harsh preaching. I know some of you really like harsh preaching because you want to be, <clears throat> I want to be, I want to toe the line. I get that. I totally get that. But what you want more than that is you want the real Jesus. The flip side of that is you don't want some compromised, lukewarm, anything goes Jesus that in the name of love doesn't care about sin. Okay? You've heard me say it many times. God cares about sin because he cares about you. Okay? It's not because he's just easily offended and how dare you question my authority? No, it's because he knows what sin does to you and to your kids and to your friends. And he knows that the master of sin, which is the enemy, is out to get your soul. So he says, flee those things. All right. Then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, notice it's just desires. Let him deny himself. You've heard these three things probably your whole life. Deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Three simple protective shields. These are done for your sake, not for his. Okay. By extension for his, but primarily they're to protect your heart. Okay. Deny yourself. I am not my own. I'm bought with a price. Think of yourself as someone that was sold as a slave. You were on the auction block. Our own sins and transgressions, the Bible says we were sold into slavery. Okay, the enemy took advantage of our, our ignorance or our youthfulness or whatever. You know, I got involved with stuff when I was a kid. I had no idea what I was getting involved. I had no idea it would shackle me to the place to where I just assumed for the rest of my life I would be that way. Well, this is just how I'm born. It was not how I was born. I didn't come out of the womb smoking weed and, you know, doing stupid things and lying and cheating and whatever. I did not come out of the womb. I had a sinful nature in me. We all do, right? We have the capacity to do good or evil. 
I came out of the, world, the womb pure and holy. I was innocent. That's why we call children innocent. That's why we love them so much. That's why, you know what I'm saying? Nobody sees a baby and go, oh, I hate you. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. We learn wickedness. We learn those things. So to deny yourself means to, you're up on the auction block and Jesus comes along and buys you. He buys you off the auction block. I know that'll be offensive. Some I'm, I don't. I apologize if it is. I'm sorry, but that's a good illustration. You were a slave to sin and Satan. You were put on the auction block. You were cheap, okay, but not in God's eyes. You're the price for you to come into relationship with Him and to be made free from your slavery was the life and the blood of Jesus. That's a heavy price, but he thought you were worth it. Okay, let him deny himself. All right, that basically, <clears throat> so after Jesus buys you off the auction block and they send you down to him, here's your new master. He takes the shackles, he unlooses them off your hands and he says, go, do whatever you want. You can go home with me if you want or you can go whatever, do whatever. See, Jesus already paid for us. But now you have a choice. That's crazy. Who would do that? Well, somebody who loved you enough to say, I can't make you love me. I can't make you love me. This is why you need to watch that video. Okay? Because whether you realize it or not, there's been a lot of distortion. Satan has been out to convince people that God is unreasonable. He's harsh. He asks too much out of you. You know, if he really loved us, he wouldn't do this and that and the other thing. He is good. He really is. Does he just turn it, you know, at evil? Does he just like, oh, you know, I love you too much to care about evil? <laughs> come, on. come on, that doesn't even make sense. And you know it doesn't. All right. So he says, deny yourself. I'm no longer my own. Take up your cross. What does that mean, take up your cross? Well, it literally means you die to your own will. Now, it doesn't mean you don't have a will anymore, but you understand that your will is not always right. It's not always in line with God. Uh, you, like Jesus, okay? Even Jesus had to do this, okay? What did Je Jesus went to the cross, as it were, before he went to the, the literal cross. What did he say? He's in the, the garden of Gethsemane, the olive garden, the, pr the place where they pressed the olive and made oil out of it. He prayed and he said, Father, take this cup from me. His will was not to suffer and die. He did not want to do it. Just like you and I. I would not go, yay, I've been waiting for this. <laughs> Hooray. <laughs> yay, they're going to pull out my beard. They're going to. No. I mean, he said, Lord, as the weight of the world came down upon his shoulders, he said, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, this was his taking up his cross. And he'd been doing it a long time. You don't live a sinless life without taking up your cross every day and saying, not my will, but yours be done. And can I tell you this? That's not harsh. That's not unreasonable. That's protection. That's done for your benefit. Because he knows if you don't do that, you will go astray. And then you'll suffer. And then sometimes you'll go for years and years trying to get out from underneath that thing that has you shackled again. Okay? Everything God does, he does for your good. Even, even if you don't understand it today. Okay? And not everything that happens is God doing something. You know, bad things happen and we blame God for it. Got to stop doing that too. All right, take up his cross daily. daily. It says daily. This is Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Okay? So there's the pro and the con, or the con and the pro. The con is, don't. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to just do whatever I want to do. I'm going to do his will. I'm going to do my best to say, not my will, like my, my friend Jesus did. Not my will, but yours be done, Father. And then I'm going to do my best to, okay, that's the, resist the bad. Here's the, do the good. I'm going to do my best to follow him. Whosoever is led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. That, that's not complicated either. It just means that he says, I stand at the door and knock. If you let me in, I will come inside. It literally says inside you, into them. I will come into them and I'll dwell there. I will sup with them. Then the sup is an old-fashioned word that means to have supper. 
means to commune, like having a meal. You're sitting down, you're talking. He says, I'm going to walk in you. No, you're not. You're the temple of the Lord, and the Lord dwells in you. He lives in you, my friend, 24-7. That's a gift that just can't be beat. What a precious thing. Listen to me now. That there are times that you would do things that I would not want to be with you. <laughs> I get what I'm saying? God is so much better than us. God says, yeah, you're going to do some really dumb things, but I'm going to live inside you anyway. He might be going, oh my gosh, I can't believe that I did that. But you're toting around Jesus on the inside. You Once you ask him to come in. Now, I was raised in an environment where we didn't exactly teach a word for word, but we kind of had this concept. Man, you know, you mess up and do something stupid. Jesus just jumps out of the ship. <laughs> That's not what he said. I choose to believe what he said, not what everybody else says. What Jesus said is, I'll never leave you, never forsake you. Now, you don't want to put him to the test. He said that too. He said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Okay? You don't want to do that. It's never saying, glory, say amen, amen, amen. And, and Deborah is just saying, Emmanuel, God with us. That's the word we're now. And remember this, God is not just with us. God is in us. That's the difference between the God who walks the earthly sod and the God who is on the inside of you. All right. Let me finish here. It says, for whoever desires to save his life. In other words, I'm going to do things my way. I'm going to be the God of my life. Read Psalm chapter 2 again. It's just a few verses. Why? It asks the question. And you can feel the frustration in the question. Why do the heathen rage? I mean, you look around yourself and you're like, these people are literally losing their minds. I mean, they're like, I mean, you know, clinically insane where they are casting off common sense. Why do the heathen rage and people imagine a vain thing? For they say, and he, he defines it, for they say this. Let us cast off his bonds. In other words, they're saying, <clears throat> are you ready for this? They are espousing satanic theory, satanic doctrine. Do you know that the Bible talks about doctrine or teachings of demons? Doctrine literally means teaching, okay? Demons teach, yuck, okay? It says, let us cast off his bonds. Doesn't that sound like the devil? It is what the enemy said. I will not be... Allow, I will not, he will not be my God. I'm going to ascend to the sides of the north. I'm going to sit on a throne, the throne that belongs to God, and I'm going to be like the Most High. Let us cast off his bonds. I don't want his restraints. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. I am going to be my own God. Not smart. Okay? Whoever desires to save his life. You see, God is trying to save your life. Just like a good father, I know some of you had bad dads. You know, I, my apologies, I'm sorry for, on their behalf. I know at some point, heaven, heaven or hell, they'll realize they made a mistake and they'll do, they'll wish that they could apologize. So I'll apologize on their behalf ahead of time. Not that they're, they're, all fathers are not good, but good fathers want to protect you. They want to save your life from all the foolish things that you might do or someone else might do to you. God is trying to save your life from the enemy. He's trying to save your life from yourself. Okay? But whoever desires to save his own life is going to do it yourself. You're going to be in charge. You're going to be the guy. You're going to be the gal. It says, we'll lose it. You cannot, unto eternity, ultimately save your life. You cannot get where God created you to go by yourself. You can't. You can't do it. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how much you believe it's true. It'll never be true. You need the Lord that made you. Okay? He says, For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. In other words, you, you go ahead and let me be the dad I want to be. Just let it happen. Quit being so bullheaded. Okay? Just, I'll save it. I'll save it for you. Trust me, I'll save it for you. Oh, it's always going to be happy. It's always going to be joyful. No, no, it won't. Absolutely won't. Okay? But he's always going to be with you. All right. What profit is a man? This is Jesus still talking. For what profit is to a man if he gains the whole world and himself is destroyed or lost? Okay? So he's literally saying, you're going to do it yourself because you're afraid I'm going to take stuff from you. 
Okay, I'm going to give you a miserable life because that's what the devil has told you. So you're afraid and you don't want to do it or you're locked into some bondage and you can't seem to find your way out. What would a person give in exchange for their soul? What earthly thing could you possibly want enough to trade for your eternal soul? There isn't anything. Not if you think about it wisely. All right. And then he goes on to talk about being ashamed. He said, whoever is ashamed of me and my words... Of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory, in his Father, and the holy angels, I tell you the truth. And then he goes on. Okay, I'm going to skip down. <clears throat> Isaiah 45, 21 says this. It says, actually, I'm going to skip that. It's, it's, I don't have time, but it's a verse that talks about, Look to me, all you nations, and be saved. Okay, there is no other. The Lord says, ah, maybe I do need to read this. Okay, look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. Some translations, all you nations. For I am God and there is no other. There is no other. It's not Buddha. Okay? It's not Joseph Smith. It's not Confucius. It's not the Catholic Church. It's not the Protestant Church. It's not the Baptist or the Pentecostals. It's not Jim Moore. It's not. It's him. He says, look unto me. I am, I am the one. I am the answer. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am Emmanuel. I am God made flesh. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. All things were made by Him. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. If you still are celebrating Christmas, I'm going to throw a Christmas in here, just because you want to give presents to your friend, friend, you are missing the best part of it. It is a day to reflect how God loved you so much that He says, I'm going to become one of you. I'm going to become one of you. So I can unseat some of the deception. That's why you need to watch that movie. I'm going to become one of you so I can unseat some of the deception that has lodged itself in your heart about who I really am. I want to show you who I really am. Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. Come on. He did this because he knew we would give place to the enemy's lies about who God really is. The good, the bad, the stuff, yeah. There's no bad about God, but you get what I'm saying. The stuff that the enemy tells you are bad. All right, it says, Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. I have sworn by myself. This is stunning. I have sworn by myself, saith God, the word that has gone out of my mouth in righteousness will not return to me, that to me every knee will bow, and every tongue will take an oath or confess. Now the, the New Testament finishes that out, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. One day, every bony knee will kneel down. <clears throat> Even the devil himself. You know what? I don't want to be among his company when the kneeling starts. I want to be in the heavenly realm. See, I'm not just living for today. I'm living for another day. And so should you. It's the wise way to live. And your true north is that one day, every knee will bow. One day, all the things you don't understand, you will. It may not come now, but it will. It will. That's an anchor to your soul in the troubled times. Mm, sorry. Had a little hiccup there. All right. Acts chapter 16. Well, it just seems so complicated. It's really not. You know, there's a group of people that cried out to the disciples. They said, uh, Sirs, this is Acts, what did I say? Acts chapter 16, verse 30 through 33. Acts 16, 30. Sirs, they cried out to one of the apostles. What must I do to be saved? Actually, this was... Paul and Silas, in jail, persecuted, unjustly, hurting. Their bodies had been whipped. They were bruised and broken. They had every reason to point their finger at God and say, You meanie, how dare you, okay? But they didn't. They trusted in the Lord. Okay, I, I shouldn't say they have every right. You know what I'm saying. The conditions were right for them to do that. But they didn't. They held their ground. They worshipped God. God responded to their faith, sent an earthquake. All the prisoners were loosed. 
the the uh, magist the prison prison superior the guard whoever he was the guy that ran the prison saw what was happening it was a death sentence that, that if a prisoner got released he was about to fall on his sword and kill himself Paul and Silas instead of like heading for the hills woohoo God set us free they stayed there to witness to this guy come on. You know, sometimes I think, you know, we as Christians have so much to learn. We really do about laying our lives down. These guys really did lay their lives down. Anyway, so the guy comes in and they, Paul and Silas said, hey, don't do yourself no harm. We're still here. Everybody, not just that, not just Paul, everybody. They all were there. None of the prisoners left. And this humbled, it broke the man. You see, Matching violence with violence does not break people's hearts. Railing for railing, persecution for persecution, an eye for an eye, a strike for a strike, a wound for a wound, that doesn't change people's hearts. Now, I, I know, I know there are times you may have to defend yourself. You may be called upon to defend someone. I, I get that. If I see a grown man out on the street, you know, attacking a little child, I'm going to beat that man down. I'm not just going to come up and say, brother, you know, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm not trying to be facetious. I'm saying there are times where God actually requires us to make a stand. Okay, I, I get that. But that is not ultimately what's going to remedy that person's brokenness. They need the Lord. They need a heart change. If God can change a man like Saul, who was holding someone's coat while they stoned. Have you ever seen anyone stoned to death? It's gruesome. So Saul, before he became Paul, held the coat of Stephen while everybody threw these giant rocks on him and crushed his skull and, and, the, and the breath went out of him. And he did it again and again and again. I believe that Saul was probably responsible for putting some Christians into the lion, into the Colosseums to be torn apart limb from limb, fathers and mothers with their children. I know it's terrible sounding, but you need to know. I think he was responsible. If God can get a hold of a man like that, then you haven't gone too far. Okay? And the people out there <clears throat> that are doing evil things that you want to make a stand against, I understand sometimes we have to. Okay? We're not supposed to just let evil run rampant in in the name of loving people. Okay, we are not. That is not Bible. But you must realize every one of those people that dies in a war that doesn't know Christ, they drop into a Christless eternity. Conquering that person doesn't change their heart. You know what changes the hearts of people? And ultimately, you must remember. He says, I'm not willing that any should perish. Okay? Okay. I want every single person to be saved. And so this Philippian jailer, who no doubt was a very bad person, he cries out. He says, what must I do? He, he says, um, sirs, to Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? He was broken. Okay. He saw, he saw a miracle. He's like, I'm, I'm done. Okay. So they said, real simple. Well, listen, there's four spiritual laws you need to know about. And, uh, you know, A, all of sin come surely will be, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I'm not mocking, I guess maybe I kind of am. I, I understand that sometimes we want to take people through this. I get that. But really, they said, believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus. Believe that he's who he says he is. Believe that he is God made flesh. Believe that God has come down to men to show men who they really are and who he really is. Believe on him. Just believe. Do you know what your number one battle is on the earth? Believing. It really is. Because you do what you believe. And you don't do what you don't believe. So your battle is not really what you're doing. It's what you're believing. Did you get that? You do what you believe. And you don't do what you don't believe. So your battle is not so much what you're doing, but what you're believing. And Jesus confirmed that. What did he say? You will know the truth. The word know means to intimately be acquainted with him. Okay? You'll know it. You'll believe it. You'll embrace it. You'll, you'll accept it. You'll know the truth. And that truth will ultimately and eventually make you free. So he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and your house. Okay. And it was. I'm going to end right here. Last one. Oh, can I just say this about your house too? Don't give up on your kids. 
<clears throat> I don't care if you've made them a wreck or the world has made them a wreck. I, I tell you, I feel so bad for kids today. Um, they are, they have access to every form of evil and perversion in the world. And don't you think they haven't looked? Because they have. And don't think that that has no effect on them, because it does. And we are living in times that we've never lived in before. I'm not sure we ever even could have imagined it like this. Sodom and Gomorrah has nothing on this generation, I'm telling you. But you remember the promise that God gave. Don't give up on your family. Okay, Don't give up on your family. He said, you shall be saved. If you're a matriarch or a patriarch, a grandma, grandpa, mom or dad, and, and you've got family that are not serving the Lord, don't you give up on them. Don't you have this kind of a passive savoir faire kind of a, oh, it's all in God's hand, it really matter. There's nothing I can do anyway, so I'm not going to do anything. Okay, that's not true. You have influence with God and them. Okay, even if they have cut you off, they hate you, and you're just nothing but a pile of dirt to them, you at least still have influence by virtue of the fact that you're their parent. Well, I've messed up. No, who cares? Because God will forgive your mess ups. Believe me, he has no intention to hold that over you and say, well, I'm sorry you blew it, so now you and I, you have nothing to say about your kids because of what you did in the past. That's garbage. You messed up? Awesome. Go to him, tell him about it, ask him to forgive. You know, I really believe that God gives parents who make mistakes the opportunity for redemption. I actually know that's a fact because my dad made huge mistakes with his kids and he's in heaven interceding for us right now. I know because I've seen it. I saw my dad standing next to Jesus. And when he, when I looked at them, I knew though I was going through something at the time. I was going through a, like a kind of a deliverance thing, an inner healing sort of a thing. Did not expect this to happen, but I had this open eye vision of my dad standing next to Jesus. And I, I suddenly understood I was in that class. I was in that moment because he asked Jesus to put me into it. I just knew I would all die knowing that that was the truth. What am I saying? Your mistakes are not the end. Okay, so even if you may get them under the blood, come on, don't waste any more time. Get them under the blood. Then ask the Lord Jesus. Okay, I still have influence. I may not have influence with them, but I know I have influence with you. You pray about them night and day. You pray about them. You take them to God. He says, you shall be saved and your house. It's your promise. Cling to it. Hold fast to it. Even if you die not seeing it, it does not change the legitimacy and the faithfulness of he who promised. It's not just a promise. It's the promise giver. Okay? If the promise giver gives it, it cannot fail. All right, last one. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 18 through 20. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he that commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. I could spend a lot of time talking about that, but I'm not. Do you not know? Okay, connected to this idea of, of fleeing immorality because it affects not only the other people, but it affects you personally, okay? Do you not know that your body, okay, your physical body, <laughs> you know, people joke about stuff that's holy. They really do. Hey, my body's a temple. <laughs> it's actually... That's, they stole that. That's actually what God says about your body. It literally, he says, your body is my temple. You might have kicked me out, but it's still my temple. And I'm waiting one day for you to get smart enough to ask me back in. Jesus standing at the door. <laughs> Do you not know that your body, everyone say body, physical body, is the temple of the Holy Ghost who lives in you. He's actually inside of you if you've asked him to come in. And listen, he won't come in because you're good. And he won't not come in because you're bad. He'll come in because Jesus made a way. And you have enough faith to ask and believe in what Jesus did. That's it. you got to believe that. Okay? All right. He lives in you, who you have, the Holy Spirit, whom you have from God. And you are not your own, but you're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The link I put on here is an interview from two men that almost look like they're at opposite poles, but you're going to find out they're not. And I really encourage you to listen to as much of it as you can. 
at least listen to the first 10 or 15 minutes of it, Glenn Beck and Dallas Jenkins. So you're going to like it. I guarantee you're going to like it. I hope you do. Okay. And again, don't, oh, I don't like Glenn Beck. Oh, I don't like, you know, whatever. Just stop. Stop, stop, stop. Okay. All right. Love you guys. Thanks for putting up with me and listening to me. I really do appreciate. Hey, Mom. I love you. Um, <clears throat> thanks for your kindness to us. Thanks for um, helping us. Um, I don't. I try not to say a lot about our support. I guess because I just don't want to. <laughs> we sure need some help. We could sure use some help. Uh, we've had a huge drop off, and so we could use some help. Really, what we could use more than anything is we we pretty much most of our subsistence comes from people who do monthly. And uh, I've got people that do as little as like twenty dollars a month, and I value that as much as the two thousand. I like the two thousand. <laughs> Actually, we don't have any of those right now. Consider helping us monthly. That would you know, and and again, you're investing in two, not just us. Although. I'm going to be truthful. I think Linda and I are worth investing into. <laughs> oh, how proud. No, I just think we are. I think Jesus thinks that about us too. I do. I, yeah. Anyway, but really, it's about what we're saying. It's about the fact that we're on here giving out the gospel, that we're trying to help people. We want people to be saved and so on and so on. So you're, even if you don't see the value in us as much, uh, you know, I shouldn't say that, but really, do you value the ministry that we're putting out there? And uh, if that's yes, I uh, encourage you to help us out monthly. Uh, we don't have merchandise to sell. Maybe one day we will. I should get a t-shirt with my picture on it and say Papa Jim or yeah, whatever. Anyway, I'll stop being silly. Love you guys. God bless you. We will uh, we'll hopefully see you tomorrow. And see those of you on the online Song of Songs class, we'll see you tonight. God bless you and give yourself permission. And share the video to have a great day. Bye.